Jacob Pelletier, the Water Wastewater Superintendent for the Town of Harwich. Uh, before we get into things, I just want to go over a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, this meeting is going to be recorded and broadcast, so just be aware that that is taking place. Um, I'm going to hit record just momentarily. This conference will now be recorded. All right, so to try to keep things flowing in a um, functioning fashion, I am gonna keep everybody muted and I would ask that people looking to speak um, raise their hand. Um, there should be an, if you click, let's see. Or I guess turn your screen on and wave and we'll have to call on you if there's no uh, opportunity for you to raise your hand here. Sorry, my apologies. So really the, what we're looking to do here tonight is gain the public's input for revisions to the CWMP. And we will engage in some light discussion, but we're really looking to hear from the public and get, get your thoughts and feedback. So I'm gonna turn it over to Anastasia, but before I do, just a disclaimer, if my mic is hot, I do have two Great Danes and three children in the house, so there may be some background noise. So I will do my best to, to keep the mic uh, off when I can. So Anastasia, take it away. You are muted right now. Perfect. Sorry about that. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, I got gotcha. you. Perfect. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Anastasia Widenko. I am a project manager with GHD, and I'll be working on this project with Russ Quickham, um, who's a senior project manager with GHD. And this project is focused on the town's comprehensive wastewater management plan, which is a nutrient and, man and wastewater management tool that's developed to support the town's vision for its growth. So that's an important distinction we wanted to make right away in this presentation. Um, this is supposed to be a companion tool to how the town intends to grow and is not intended to replace or to serve as a zoning plan. And the purpose of this plan is to come up with a strategy to remediate Harwich's five nitrogen impaired watersheds and the identified impaired freshwater ponds within the town. In 2016, the town completed um, an initial comprehensive wastewater management plan that was approved by the state. Since then, there have been a, a number of updates, including new, uh, new partnership opportunities that have been identified with neighboring communities specifically with the towns of Brewster and Dennis. The Muddy Creek Covert Widening Project has been implemented, which has increased the tidal flushing of that system and has provided a lot of new data um, as we're learning about how much nitrogen is being flushed through that increased opening. And that data is being used to update the models that show us how much nitrogen needs to be removed from our estuaries in order to meet nitrogen targets and restore those estuaries. The town has also been actively participating in the Pleasant Bay Alliance and is a member of the Pleasant Bay Watershed Permit and has started initial sewer implementation. So with all these changes, there's a desire to come up with a targeted revision strategy for the plan. Um, this is intended to be an open and transparent process with the purpose of identifying specific components of the CWMP that the town is considering revising. Um, it's meant to have a very strong stakeholder input, which we're starting with today, um, to help develop those revisions and then to provide draft recommendations that are consistent with stakeholder input. There have been a number of pro uh, topics that have already been identified for this revision and that have already been worked into the scope of this project which include reviewing zoning and build out assumptions that were used in the original CWMP to explore these new partnership opportunities that have come up with neighboring communities, to continue the evaluation of incorporating onsite INA systems into the overall plan through an adaptive management approach, 
and to revisit the overall implementation phasing and cost models that were initially developed. So we're starting today um, with one of at least two public input sessions that are meant to provide um, an opportunity for everyone to, um, to provide their comments on the work that's been done to date and revisions that they would like to see going forward. We'll take all those comments, um, incorporate them into our evaluation and incorporate them into draft language that's consistent with those stakeholder interests and present that language to the Board of Selectmen for consideration at the same time engaging regulatory um, agencies for their preliminary review and comments. Once that's been worked through, we'll assemble a draft notice of project change. So this is the official mechanism for changing ACWMP that will be submitted and presented to stakeholders. And then once that's finalized, we'll undergo the MEPA process, which is the official regulatory process to make the changes to the CWMP. Um, so the primary purpose of today is to have a listening session to provide an opportunity for input. At this point, I would like to turn it over. Um, we would ask that anybody that speaks provide their name and their address so that we can record all the comments. And then we'll start developing um, an evaluation and responses to those comments. All right, Anastasia, I think that's the last of your slides, correct? Yes. All right, so if we want to turn off the screen share, um, and I guess I would invite anyone at this point who is interested in sharing some comments um, to turn on their camera or and, and make themselves known, if you will. People can also, you. oh, all right, we got a couple. So let's go with Peter. You're the first one to come on here. Uh, thanks, Dan. My name's Peter Gorey. I live on Sisson Road. I, I have to apologize. I've been following the wastewater planning pretty closely. And I guess I know that this was an input session, but I was, I'm was i surprised a little bit that there wasn't even like an overview of where we are, you know, contract amounts, tech you know not down to the technical you know uh, uh details but even a summary not so much about process so i know where those uh, those items are available online but are you doing presentations at milestones or quarterly where people actually can hear from you how is it going oh, where are we at where what phases that were in maps three, four, and five years ago, where do those fall now? Um, I, I know we're in a new contract. I know we're in a new phase, so I understand that. But but can someone, can you tell me, Dan, just where's the information that we're supposed to respond to? Because I know a lot of things are new. Stop and listen. Yeah, so happy to uh, respond to that. So that's, that's one of the, oh, I'm just gonna mute all here real quick. Hold on, a little feedback. All right, I think I'm still on. Um, so that's what I'm trying to get to. So I, I feel your question. Um, I, I really do, right? Because I, you have to imagine, I get a lot of comb calls from residents who are, have looked at the phasing maps, you know, that have been published by the town. Um, and they're saying, hey, I'm in, you know, phase two or phase three or phase four. Um, you know, I'm putting an addition on my house. You know, when is this going to be coming? And I, I, I haven't had the ability to answer that question, right? And and that's really because we had the bid overrun with phase two, um, which had to require us to strip back the construction there. And, and, and now we're really just getting to phase three, right? Which I would still argue is, is, is a focus in East Harwich because it's tied to our watershed permit so we're we're using that as a driving factor for continued progress there but that doesn't we don't have a watershed permit or a regulatory requirement in other parts of town 
So we're really using this CWMP revision process to produce new maps and new schedules and new timelines so we can give you information that is more comprehensive than what we had before. Um, you know, there's a number of things in the in the current CWMP that are that are missing. Um, you know, consideration to other capital projects that the town may take on during this next 20 years that really could impact our ability to fund sewer infrastructure. So that's part of some of the revisions we're looking to do here is to take into consideration those other things that were missing before so that we can give you a more accurate and comprehensive plan, if that answers your question. I think it does a little bit and thank you and I'm not trying to put you on the spot. Uh, I'll, I'll let ever, other people ask questions. It's really about the phasing is one, but an example might be when some of us in town are looking to evaluate nearby development projects or development sort of writ large, absent an understanding of, again, I, I think important also is where where is it now? I saw the re most recent hookup uh, map um, and also, how is it going? <laughs> because if we're thinking about uh, evaluating nearby development projects or our own projects, we need some roadmap. And it could be a 20, if, if you told me tonight, it's likely that this is a 25 or 30 year plan, which I've heard anecdotally before. I, it would be better than not knowing anything. Um, and I'm not looking for an answer. I'm just, that's a rhetorical statement. I'll, I'll be quiet so other people can ask their questions. Thank you. Well, Peter, thanks for, I appreciate your comment and, and totally understand where you're coming from. And I totally also share your frustration. Um, and with that, I would invite, <laughs> I would invite the next, uh, I see Anne raising her hand. Um, feel thank free to turn for, your mic on. Can you hear me? Thank you for taking my questions. Um, I'm wondering uh, whether the ARPA funds that have become available at the county level and also at the town level um, are going to change your vision of the timeline because uh, Barnesville County has indicated that wastewater infrastructure is one of their priorities. Um, I would very much like to see the project expedited. We have a pond, I live on uh, 10 Paradise Path and we have a pond that uh, is facing water quality issues, uh, primarily from septic leakage. And we'd love to see the sewers going in a lot faster. We're currently scheduled under the CWMP to be uh, sewered sometime in the 2040s, maybe almost 2050. By that point, we're not gonna have a pond worth you know, anything. So I'm, I'm wondering if ARPA money can be credited toward, uh, allocated toward expediting this project. And if not the ARPA money, I can't imagine anything more important in terms of capital investment in any place on the Cape. This is this is critical. Water is absolutely critical. So when you say there are other capital projects that might take precedent or that might push back the schedule even more, I'm dumbfounded. So um, I guess my two questions, will ARPA accelerate it? And what else could possibly be more important that would drive this schedule even further out? All right, if I can, uh, I'll start. And, and if Russ or Anastasia wants to add in, feel free. So um, with respect to other potential capital projects, with that, I was referring to, say, the school needs a new roof or there some fire, you know, we need a new fire truck or, you know, those are, those can be multi-million dollar expenses that with respect to a 20-year borrowing and maintaining a level tax rate, you, you need to kind of strategize how and when you're going to borrow money. So that was kind of what I was referring to because the current capital plan in the existing CWMP doesn't take into account any other town capital projects. So to be more effective and realistic with a timeline, we need to consider other, you know, necessary expenses. And then with respect to ARPA funds, um, I actually had a webinar today. I am very, 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 very interested in the ARPA funds, as well as the Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act. So that is the second piece of legislation that equates to about $1.2 trillion um, with a large sum of money for water and, and wastewater. Um, the word from DEP and the Clean Water Trust today was that they are still waiting for guidance from EPA 
for them to interpret and then disseminate to us. So it's still all very new um, with respect to ARPA and the, the $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill. Um, but I am, I can tell you, I am certainly paying attention to every webinar and, and email that comes out with information with respect to this funding. And I intend to seek using it whenever and wherever possible to, to, to get the best benefit for the town of Harwich. Thank you very much. I hope you have luck with that. Yep. And, and, and I'll just add, I'm Russ Kleekamp. I'm uh, one of the engineers working on this project. We, I have gotten uh, multiple concerns or uh, inquiries uh, from residents regarding the status of freshwater ponds, specifically Bucks Pond was one that was mentioned to me. Um, we totally understand that we're protecting our resources here. Uh, the challenge for the town and engineers is that we get calls from residents that are on this pond, this pond, this pond, and everybody is, you know, a lot of people, they want to try to get it all done at once, which, um, you know, is a lot of money. These things cost a lot to do, but part of what we're doing is revising the CWMP. We're going to take a close look at that phasing plan and, and really hone in on the priorities, what we need to do right off the bat. Um, again, to, to, to put all the sewers in at once, believe me, I wish we could, but the cost is, is tremendous. It has to be broken down. So if we were to jump to another phase, then we would likely have concerns, you know, from other residents that live on other water bodies, because we can only sewer certain areas so much at a time. But your concerns about the quality of freshwater ponds um, within the town of Harwich is, is well documented. And it's, believe me, it's, it's on our radar. Thank you. All right, Joe, I see your hand up. Why don't you hop on the mic? Uh, you're muted, Joe. Let's see here. I can. It looks like he's attempting to unmute. Let's give him a second here. Here we are. Oh, there we are. I think you can right, hear me. Got you. My name is yep. Joe, Joe LaRose. I live on 14 Lakeside Terrace. I'm part of the Great Sand Lakes Association. Wow. And um, what, what I, I, I remember back, uh, uh, and by the way, I'm calling from a house I have in Florida here. <laughs> I didn't bring any paperwork with me, but I remember several years ago, um, probably 10 years ago or so, I had a telephone discussion with a guy, I think his name was David Young. He worked for the consulting firm in Boston that was handling the first, uh, basically, I think it was three phases of sewering for Harwich. Um, and phase three, which, which he gave me, uh, um, some, uh, actually I had a meeting with him also, and he gave me some maps that showed phase one, phase two, phase three, which I still have back in my house in Harwich. And, um, phase three showed where the, the uh, where the sewers were going to go in, um, up along Queen Anne road, as far as John Joseph, and it was going to cover all of the properties of great sand lake lakes that are on the north side of the lakes, basically. And it was explained uh, at one of our Great Sand Lakes meetings, I can't remember the name of the person who uh, did the explanation for us, that they had done a study on the water flow into the, the lakes of uh, Bucks and, and primarily Bucks and John Joseph and, and the other lakes there on Great Sand Lakes and everything was flowing from the north to the south. And and if, if the lakes were gonna get um, corrupted, if you will, or, or polluted, um, because of wastewater, et cetera, it was going to be the northern side, the houses on the northern side that would do it. And that's what, and then David, David Young, the Boston consultant said, we took that information into, into consideration when we developed phase three. And then just reading different reports that, that were coming out in the Cape Cod Chronicle, and uh, um, I think it was all in the Cape Cod Chronicle, which I get. And um, it basically said that, you know, the town had, had uh, overspent, I guess, on phases one and two. And um, then they said that they would delay phase three. And it finally came out that phase three was going to be, be delayed and become the very last phase um, after, at the time they talked about developing a, um, a joint, um, a, a, joint uh, a, a storage treatment plant with Dennis and Yarmouth. And it said, after all of, all of Harwich is done, then we'll come back and we'll do this phase three for Great Sand Lakes in 2048. And I thought, wow, um, especially at everything I'd heard from the people in Boston and the presentation that was made to the Great Sand Lakes Association meeting that uh, waiting till 2048 was kind of a long time. And, and why would it be the last consideration 
after everything else in Harwich had been sewered. Uh, so my question is, is there any opportunity to use some of these, uh, these federal monies here to push this phase three, um, which, which again, I, I, I have copies of these maps that show this phase three coming over to cover the north, the north part of Great Sand Lakes area there. Again, Queen Anne Road as far as John Joseph and all of the houses that are to the north of the, uh, of, of the Great Sand Lakes uh, area there uh, uh, on Queen Anne and above Queen Anne to Queen Anne also. So that's that's what I I was wondering if again this could be pushed up and I'll I'll be quiet now. <laughs> so if I can, uh, oh sorry, sun's in the back here. <laughs> um, I'll, let me take a first stab at that. So, um, you know, to to your point, and 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 ultimately the CWMP that was submitted to the regulatory agencies. Um, there, there must have been changes between the conversation you had with Dave and the document that was submitted. Because when, at least when I came to the town in 2016 or six, six seven years ago, the freshwater ponds and Great Sand Lakes specifically were moved to phase eight. And the reason that, you know, I, I'm, I haven't had anyone tell me their particular reason, but I can speculate based on my understanding of that DEP you know, is regulating nitrogen as a contaminant. And because there's such a focus on nitrogen, unfortunately, that has neglected the focus on phosphorus in freshwater ponds. So the CWMP, the MEP reports, the 208 with the Cape Cod Commission and, and the, the litigation that was, uh, you know, proposed against the town from the... Uh, Drawing the someone jump in if you can if you can remember the name of the um, firm that was suing everyone for for nitrogen for septic systems um, conservation law foundation law thank you yeah. yes so the conservation law foundation was suing towns on Cape Cod due to septic system pollution and nitrogen pollution in the estuaries and embayments which didn't identify phosphorus as a problem so that as I'm speculating, is the reason it was moved to the end of the plan because there was a regulatory issue to address with the nitrogen. That said, this is the town of Harwich's CWMP. And if the town of Harwich wants to treat these water bodies equally, then that's what the CWMP should do. I just went off mute again. Uh Again, I, I'm just suggesting that if we wait, and a, a, a previous woman that was speaking, I didn't catch her name, said that these ponds will probably won't, won't be worth much if we wait till 2048 or the late or 2050 um, to sewer that, that area there. Um, and I, I would, I think, tend to agree with that. Uh, fortunately, the, the ponds have not had any of the problems com compared to like Hinckley's Pond um, and some of the other water bodies in the area yet. But I think it's just a matter of time. And I just thought that if there was any chance for the town of Harwich to uh, use some of this money to push this forward a few years, um, rather than waiting to 2048, it would it would um, benefit the uh, property owners uh, um, and, and, and so forth and so on if the ponds were still swimmable. Right now, they are perfectly good and perfectly swimmable. Um, I'm on Bucks Pond, and um, we, we uh, especially during the, the pandemic this past summer, we, we had our grandkids and, and uh, people there swimming in the lake uh, on and off all summer so the water has been, been pristine actually but i don't think it's going to stay that way until 2048. <laughs> and I'll, I'll just con to conclude that uh comment dan um i absolutely i'll acknowledge that the concern is that if we wait till 2048 is there irreversible damage in these ponds um over the last even recent years i've seen ponds i live in centerville i'm on the water all the time i see the ponds first up i've seen ponds get algae blooms that i haven't seen in 20 years when you start getting the blooms, we have a high concentration of phosphorus in the water, and then things start to become very dicey with the health of the pond, right? We have we have reduced clarity. Um, we have all these things mitigating the water. So absolutely, you know, we don't we don't want it to get to that point. We want to try to be proactive with this, not reactive. So understood and documented the concerns with the ponds. All right, welcoming our next guest speaker. I do see a couple uh, coming in the chat here. 
All right. If anyone's looking to speak, they can uh, certainly speak up. If not, I will go to the chat. Hi there. Uh, I'm Christy, and this is Clinton. Um, Welcome. Oh. Thanks for joining us. Hi. Um, so we're relatively new to Harwich. I was more connected to Chatham, but um, fourteen rainbow. So I know that uh, you know with the um, Muddy Creek improvements, the additional flushing because the culvert was uh, enlarged. Did that change the situation? And is that going to be a factor in um, reconsidering the sequence of the improvements? Yes. So hold on, uh, a little feedback. I'm just going to read off here. All right, so yes, the widening of Muddy Creek um, has certainly had an impact. Um, that has been documented, and I would say partially. Um, we can see it with measuring the salinity of the water in Muddy Creek. So we can see that it's more salty than it was previously um, compared to record drawings or record, record data. Um, but where we're at right now, um, and I'm going to dive into kind of a yeah, just it's taking me a lot of time to figure out how to try to uh, explain this. So if it's confusing, please speak up and, and ask for clarification. So flushing is one component of the Muddy Creek uh, water body, and the attenuation rate of Muddy Creek is another component. And they're both variables in an equation that really determines how much we have to sewer in those contributing watersheds. So with Muddy Creek, the attenuation rate has changed from a 2006 MEP report. There was a 2010 MEP report, which was what our watershed permit was based upon. And then there was a 2020 watershed permit. Now, the 20, 2006 and 2020 agree, which is great. Unfortunately, the one outlier is the one that our permit was based on. So the work that the Pleasant Bay Alliance is doing, um, we recently contracted and had a third party review the work that determined that attenuation rate. And what we're working towards right now, and we just uh, signed a contract with UMass to run a new linked watershed model. And what that model is going to do is evaluate the change in attenuation rate to what we now believe to be consistent with the 2006 report. So we're going to include that as well as the new hydrodynamics that were a result of the widening of the Muddy Creek Bridge. And those things in combination will tell us what our new attenuated load is. Now, the attenuated load is the starting point at which we need to remove from to get down to what we're supposed to be at. So the new linked, moders, linked watershed model will give us a new start point to evaluate exactly what we need to do to meet the nitrogen removal requirements. And at that point, <laughs> at that point, we can then say whether or not we need to do more sewering in and around the 137, 39 area where we were just at. So feel free to Ask any questions. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that very full response. All right. I see Karen Whitting raising her hand. Hop on. Hi, I'm Karen Whitting. I live on Hall's Path at 1399. And um, I, I have two, I don't think they're questions, they're just feedback. Um, and the one is that I hope that with this update, we can have a clearer documentation of why decisions were made. Um, I know for myself, reading the CMP, I could not figure out why priorities were put together the way they were. You know, this was early, this was late. I couldn't figure any of that out when I read it. And, um, and I, I think that we should have real clarity on that. And honestly, maybe we should review the the doc, document the um, proper the priorities and the reasons for different kinds of choices early, um, so that that's something people understand. You know, one of the things that worries me is there's so much focus on Pleasant Bay, and there are a lot of other areas of Harwich that also need work, and yet 
everything's about been so far about Pleasant Bay. So, you know, is that really the top priority? And, and if so, why? You know, I'd be looking for that kind of explanation. And I guess um, I would hope that the goal ultimately is to get the most, um, in, um, you know, of bad stuff out, you know, so affect the most sewer with the least possible cost. So that if there is one place we could put sewers in where it's going to be costly because it's an uphill climb and, you know, it's not going to be an easy flow and there's houses far apart that maybe that's not the best place to put sewers instead look for a place where houses are close together and you can have you don't have to do a lot of pumping etc so i hope that this cmp can consider the cost of different kinds of sewering and pick the places where we can get the most bang for the cost so that's just my feedback i don't know if there's a question there karen awesome feedback Thank you very much. It was well thought out and well presented. Um, if you are all set, I will move on to Albert Glastetter. Please uh, correct if I mispronounce your name. That's the correct name, yes. Uh, we live here on vacation lanes. My husband and I are both on the thing here. We live on 40 vacation lane. And my only concern is you're talking 40 years, 30 years down the road. Number one, when I came on tonight, I expected to get some sort of a presentation as to what the actual plans for sewers were in, in the town of Harwich. And somebody talked tonight about the cost of making sewers. Has anybody put into that cost what it's going to cost the homeowners in this particular community if we have to replace our septic systems, which can run upwards of thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000? And what if the state puts new demands on our septic system and it even raises it more? So I think when we're talking about cost, you want to think about the cost to the individual homeowner, not just with taxes, but what is it going to cost us if we have to replace septic systems? What happens if I replace my septic system only to find out afterwards, because I can't live in a house without a septic system, that come three years after that, then I'm going to have to pay for sewer systems on top of that. I'd rather see the town look at the total cost of this and uh, tell people exactly what it's going to cost, what the cost would be if we had to replace septic systems, and give us a realistic time limit. I think 40 years is an unrealistic time limit to look out and say, I'm not going to get sewers in this area for 40 years. We were originally supposed to get sewers because when you put the first plan through, this area, as Joe said, was on, on the plan. Then all of a sudden it disappeared, and then all of a sudden I hear 40 years out. By 40 years from now, I won't be here because I'd have to be over 100 years old, but I would really like to see something done sooner rather than later. And I really do. I really think this is a cost thing that you're looking at only from one side. What's the tax rate? Well, what's the impact on all the individual homeowners in Harwich, if we all had to somewhere along the line replace our septic systems. Received, and I tell you, and I, and I know I said it already tonight, and I mean it, that I want to know the answers to all those questions as well. And that is really what we're trying to get, you know, this is the, tonight's the first night of us getting those answers um you know we want this sort of feedback to make sure that when we do have a plan it it is approved and what you know accepted by the public so thank you for comments and who would like to go next david driscoll we're at 17 rainbow way I want to echo what Joe said, what Ann said, and what the, the lady just previous to me said. We go out 40 years, that's too late. Uh, you started this session by saying this was an input gathering session. One thing I would say, having heard what I've heard, is you need to have a session where you're presenting more information with regard to scheduling and decision making, how decisions were made and, and what that revised schedule is. The other thing I would say, and to this is to Joe's point, the ponds, Bucks Pond and John Joseph's right now are swimmable, but data gathered by Ann Frechette and analyzed since 1999 shows a pretty consistent degradation uh, and water quality issues year over year. If you wait till 2048, it will be too late. 
So if you're looking for input, my input, and I think it echoes what Joe was saying, what Ann was saying, uh, and what others have said is, you've got to find a way to accelerate some of these activities or these ponds won't be swimmable. They'll still be pretty to look at, but you won't be able to swim in. So that's a piece of input that I hope gets recorded. And I'm not actually looking for a response from the contractor or some defense of a position. That's input that should be considered. That's it. And Dave, input received, and I know you weren't looking for a response. Um, so I guess I'll, <laughs> I, I apologize before I give one, um, you know, but the voices I'm hearing tonight about concerns around freshwater pond is one that has been echoed on the back end to me over the last seven years I've been working for Harwich. Um, Alan Thompson, one of your water and wastewater commissioners has been stating the exact same sentiment uh, for the last seven years that the current CWMP doesn't adequately address the freshwater ponds. And I think that the input tonight is certainly stressing that and emphasizing that. And I think that input is received and what we intend to do, you know, and to note, no one on this call uh, had any input in, in writing the CWMP that the town has today. And what we're looking to do is take your input and make sure that it is included. So. Um, with that, I would welcome the next guest. Oh, all right. Well, you, you, you're saying X number of years since you've known about this, but I believe the previous, uh, contracted report was 2009 and in 2009, they recommended that ponds be looked at closely, uh, you know, that they, they would be uh, tracked, that they should be monitored, that they would need help. And that was 2009. So it's not, we're not going back six or seven years, we're going back waiting for that. Yeah, and that's, I guess that's kind of my point is that it, to your point, 2009, these reports were written. In 2016, the firm that authored the CWMP did not heed those recommendations. My point in that is that I came on board over the last seven years, and now we're looking to make changes to, to you know, to take your input. Uh, because as you were all saying tonight, the CWMP as written doesn't account for the freshwater ponds adequately. Um, and, and I'm using the six, seven year timeline because that's the duration I've been here in Harwich. Um, and, you know, now we've gone through phase two, we're appropriating design money for phase three, and we're embarking on CWMP revisions that, you know, when we talk about the amortized cost of the wastewater plan, you know, in today's money, it it's in excess of 300 million. If you amortize it out to the, to the time it will be built, it's over a billion dollars of infrastructure that we're going to be putting in the ground in Harwich. Um, so it takes, you know, takes a lot of time to, to put in. And I think this input's crucial to making sure the ponds get addressed sooner in that plan. So I would welcome the next guest. Hey. Uh, Dan, this is Christine from Rainbow Way again. Um, so I hear you saying that you hear us because you just heard from several Great Sand Lakes Association people. Um, would you go so far as to say that you yourself will lobby to uh, to have freshwater ponds be a, a greater factor in the next revision? Absolutely. I, oh, right. they, they they will be. We are. We we've heard it numerous. So, um, and I'm not. It, it, not trying to be defensive. So we're a new engineer to the group, right? Um, the previous engineer developed this plan. Uh, we've had a lot of feedback on it. So this is part of the process. We have to get the feedback from the town. Where where was it wrong? Where has the town gone wrong? So absolutely. I, um, I, I do not mean to sound accusatory. I no, wasn't I, involved at all. I knew it was going on and I did not involve myself at all. So, you know, I have nothing I can say about the plan. 
Um, but I just, you know, I'm also new to it and, and you guys are being, um, you know, a little bit circumspect and I get that you can't make commitments because you two personally don't get to make the decision. But, you know, so that's why I'm sorry to put you on the spot, Dan, but, you know, if I, I asked a great question and you guys just both said, yes, we're definitely going to give it attention. That's all I need to hear. And I appreciate you saying that. And, and I think, and, and maybe it, uh, maybe it didn't come off properly the way that we kind of structured things and the way that, you know, I think people had a greater expectation for delivery of a plan, but I think, I mean, that was, that was intentional because we didn't want to come into this preemptively and try to tell you what you want. What we wanted to do is really get feedback here and then have an opportunity to digest it and then come back with a plan to the masses that, that really encompassed the, the public's input, you know? So if everyone here came out and said, we're only worried about Herring River and no one was worried about, you know, the freshwater ponds, then we would be focusing our energy on Herring River. Um, not to say we wouldn't, not to say we would neglect the, fr the freshwater ponds, but, you know, what we're trying to do is create a, a CWMP that reflects the desires, and, you know, and, and, and the importance in where the residents of Harwich wanted to focus. Um, you know, we do have to also make sure that we meet regulatory requirements, you know, but I think this is all, you know, like I said before, we're folk, the plan was focused on nitrogen because that's what the salt water and DEP and the regulatory agencies were concerned with, which, you know, we do have to meet those requirements because they do have authority to impose, you know, fines and things on us, but that doesn't mean we can't also improve fresh water and in, in, in other areas in town simultaneously and strategically, you know, so I think we're hearing it. So it wasn't that we didn't want to present information. We didn't want to be too presumptive, um, if that makes sense. And we would welcome the next speaker. We do have a couple of comments that came in the chat as well, but oh, I see in Mark, uh, if you could turn on your mic, we'd be happy to hear from you. Hello, it's, um, can you hear me? It's uh, yep. Mark Farber on Chatham Road. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, I'm only a recent re resident of um, Harwich since 2015. Before that, going back to 1995 and Brewster. So I've kind of caught up with the septic plan much later than everybody else that may have been here longer. Um, and I've been on the pond testing group in Brewster since 2000. And we have a very strong pond testing group because that's where Brewster's concern is, is the freshwater ponds. And one of the things that I learned from our testing there, and we did, uh, we were doing 29 ponds out of the 80 ponds in the town, and they now have good data for 29 of the 80 ponds over 20 years, um, was that uh, phosphorus is the critical item here, and it's a very so, slow-flowing um, pollutant versus nitrogen. It can take up to 30 years to show in the groundwater or in the ponds. So even if we were to stop phosphorus use completely, it would be 30 years before we still see the remains of that getting to the water at that point later on. So what Brewster started doing, because they don't want to put septic systems in and they haven't had a requirement so far, is one, open space, reduce commercial development. And then also the ponds groups got stronger and started requiring that fertilizers not be used around the ponds. And so each pond has their own pond association and they're taking care of their own ponds because the town it doesn't have the money really to do it other than doing the testing and the data collection. So maybe it's something, I'm not sure what this pond group, if there are pond groups in Harwich that are doing this with the state. I'll give it back to you. So I would have to defer to the Heinz Prof, the natural resource director to speak on the sampling that occurs in the freshwater and saltwater bodies in Harwich. Um, Russ, it looked like you wanted to say something and maybe Patsy may look like she has some insight on that as well. 
Yeah, we'll just add that the Association to Preserve Cape Cod has an interactive map on their website that has, you know, they track some of the ponds for the algae blooms all over Cape Cod. Um, so that's another resource that, that, that we can utilize. But again, it's, an, it's a known issue, um, the decline of freshwater bodies all over Cape Cod, specifically Harwich, specifically Bucks, Joseph, those ponds there. Um, so I, I can say I'm hearing tonight, you know, we've had multiple five, six, eight people so far, because we are going to go back to the board of select and debrief them. And when you say, you know, there's an overwhelming support for the freshwater ponds, that may shift the focus. You know, that's how these things, I say it to folks all the time, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, you know, make the point known. If you go to the boards of selectmen, they have public comment. They have, if you just keep going on there and I'm a, again, I'm big outdoors, man, freshwater, saltwater, you name it. Um, be, be aggressive. Um, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, but we have heard that, you know, absolutely 100%, we will be going back to the board and say, there's, there's a large outcry for um, focus on the freshwater ponds and agreed uh, they're declining. And if we wait too long, the damage is irreversible. Then you start talking about things like dredging and you think wastewater is expensive. Wait till you get to those types of things. And by then it's, you're right. You know, the damage can be potentially irreversible and it's, we don't want to get there. We want to be proactive. We don't want that to happen. Patsy, please hop on. I just wanted to, uh, I'm Patsy Lightbound. I live on John Joseph at Six Paradise Path, and I have participated in water quality testing over the past, I don't know, 15 years. George Myers, who's also on the call, has also participated in water testing, just as uh, you described for Brewster. Um, I, I, I also wanted to comment about the, we, we've said, uh, how much we love the ponds and the swimming and the and the recreational nature of the ponds. But the other aspect of the ponds that hasn't been mentioned so much is that this is the resource that we depend on for our for the water that we drink, the water that we use uh, in our homes. And um, John Joseph and Buck's ponds are in critical uh, locations with regard to the water that is in the town water resources. So um, we we have multiple reasons for trying to protect these ponds over the coming years. All right. I have a number of questions that have come in through the chat. So if I can just quickly run through those before we get to our next uh, video caller. So I have one from Jeff. Um, looking to know when they will be able to connect to the first area of sewers. Um, we are working on stuffing envelopes this week and next. So you should see a letter in the mail within the next couple weeks, at which point you will be able to connect into the sewer system. So um, it's right on the horizon. Let's see. From intensification of fertilizer and also insect mitigation by Dorperate firms last summer blanketed canvas neighborhoods. Can this be slowed? So let's see. Can we increase Harwich's ratio of conservation land given the rapid growth of new construction and septic use with COVID 12 month habitation as a balance. 12 month habitation as a balance. Okay, so can we increase Harwich's ratio of conservation land given the rapid growth of new construction and septic use with 12 months habitation? New septics are going in faster than sewers. Sorry, I'm just trying to read through here. General and to Anastasia and Russ. Was the drilling done or enough drilling by the prior engineering contractor to determine underground flow directions? One drill, one, three, the initial. Please jump in if you can, if you're on the chat and can see those. Sure, sure. Um, so the question is, was there adequate monitoring done to establish groundwater flow direction? And is it comparable to what was done in Orleans? Um, so it's actually the same agency that establishes groundwater flow all over Cape Cod. Those groundwater maps are originally based on USGS um, 
and then they're used by UMass, which is the, the agency that does the modeling for the, the LinkedIn model. And as Dan mentioned, that model has been updated several times. So it is a very comparable method to what was used in Orleans. I um, mean, it is a pretty advanced refinement of water flow direction and not only watersheds, but sub watersheds, looking at the extent of where water is going into different water bodies. If I can answer another one, uh... Question, what is the status of the Dennis Yarmouth wastewater treatment plant? Um, so to touch on that first, Yarmouth actually walked away from the DHY partnership and uh, opted to build their own treatment plant um, due to a scheduling conflict with a mass DOT paving project. So right now we are in very early discussions with the town of Dennis for a Dennis Harwich partnership um, yet to be explored and also asked how does the new engineering firm see its impacts on planner phases? So I think that was in reference to the treatment plan. So I think that covers that. Uh, Jeff, yes, the mail will be sent to the ad mailing address we have on file. So if you're getting your bills in New Jersey, you will get the welcome package in New Jersey as well. All right, so I think we got through the chat, so I would welcome anyone else on the call here to please hop on and um, feel free to provide some input. George. Hi, yes, uh, my name is George Myers. I'm at 22 Shady Drive. Um, I'm a member of the board of the Great Sand Lakes Association, and um, was also a participant in the preparation of the, comp the comprehensive wastewater management plan, um, which which goes back quite a number of years. Um, I would uh, uh, let me just say I would like to someday talk to you, Dan, and then Russ, who's involved in this because that's an engineering thing. Um, I try not to get into too much into the weeds, um, but. And I'll tell you, most of the comments from the people in this and the Great Sand Lakes Association have been wonderful. And I agree with most most of what's been said. Um, but one thing I think that maybe wasn't made clear, and I guess um, uh, just to put it very simply, um, to wait until 2050 or whenever is very troublesome. And um, when I brought it up years ago, I was told, well, don't worry, we'll just throw money at it and, and we'll fix the problem. The, um, right now I'm talking, I'm very talking very parochial because I'm interested primarily in the ponds of the Great Sand Lakes at this point in, in my life. And um, those ponds, like you talked about John Joseph and Bucks Pond, We've been testing, and um, I am astounded at the quality of those ponds. And um, I know from the preparation of the original uh, comprehensive wastewater uh, management plan is that, um, as uh, I think, uh, uh, let's see, who was it? Joe had said that a lot of the possible pollution would phosphorus would be entering to, uh, into John Joseph and Buck's Pond um, as the ground capacity uh, for the absorption or adsorption of phosphorus was being used up. And we had done some test pits and so forth. And, it, and we, um, we knew when the septic systems were put in place and we measured the distance between the septic systems and the edge of the pond, and uh, really concerned that the ground was using up um, most of its capacity for absorption of the phosphorus, and that additional phosphorus would be coming very close to the pond and then entering the pond. Um, I also have an environmental background, and uh, I knew 
um, that it's a lot easier. Once that phosphorus starts getting into the pond, um, it's just there's no real outlets. It stays in the pond. Now, I also knew about Long Pond, and I don't know how many people remember it, but Long Pond had a very, uh, very bad um, problem. Uh, it, um, and it really became a nightmare to fix that pond. And it was just, it was just a miserable existence in trying to, to fix it. I mean, when they, they finally fixed it with alum and uh, the community was up in arms about putting chemicals into it. Okay, I don't want to belabor this, but um, my point is, is that it's much easier to keep Bucks Pond and John Joseph and the other ponds that are in good condition, in, con in good condition, than it is to try to fix it after it becomes polluted. And I, it, I never thought that we would be waiting until 2040 or 50 before sewering so that I could, so that we could eliminate the phosphorus from moving any further close to the ponds. I'm also concerned about yeah, septic systems and all these new drugs and everything. Um, wants to be uh, uh, come along in the future, or winding up, of course, in our septic systems and then into the groundwater and then into our drinking water. And it's much easier to deal with any new drugs in the septic, in the uh, in, in the sewer system uh, at a water treatment plant than it is to try to deal with it in each person's septic system. Um, so I, I, I'm sorry I went on as long as I have, but my answer, my, my main point is, is that we have good quality ponds here, much easier to keep them clean than it is to try to deal with all the problems and the arguments and the money and everything else to try to clean them up later and maybe not even clean them up satisfactorily. So, uh, I mean, if, if you guys wish to talk to me, I'd be happy to talk to you uh, sometime in the future. But uh, that's my main point. Keep it clean rather than put your money to keep it clean rather than try to clean it up later. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, George, you're welcome. I think my cell phone number has been circulated before, but you're absolutely right. You know, a lot of times alum is used what people say fix. You're really not fixing it because the alum just mats the phosphorus to the bottom of the pond. So when you get the windy days, it, it's, it cycles internally and then it reestablishes itself. So you're not really, I think sometimes people get confused when they see clear water that it's healthy, which not necessarily, you have that mat of algae. Big problem, Santuit Pond in Mashby. It's, it's horrible. It's, 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 and the same thing's been happening. You get all the accumulation and you do this alum, but you're not stopping the inputs, right? And as long as the inputs keep coming in, you're not solving the problem. You just keep throwing more. So there's even state agencies like the Division of Ecologic Restoration. They don't support alum treatments because they don't see that as a cure. Um, so agreed, unless we stop the phosphorus. Now there's some very small, you know, there's, there's naturally occurring phosphorus that you get from things, but when you start adding in all the fertilizer and everything else, that's not the way mother nature designed the ponds, right? It, it, it's, it's just overload for it. So agreed hundred percent alum, in my opinion, isn't a satisfactory answer to fixing a solution. It's, it's, it's temporary. Agreed. <laughs> agreed. Yeah. I did have another one in the chat. Uh, yeah. And it asks, can we go beyond the ponds to a larger restriction on fertilizer and a regular insect mitigation? Close but not on ponds are critical as well. So, with respect to the fertilizer regulation, what I'm I can. I'm online with a mic so that well, I. Oh, <laughs> I, well, <you're> all right. <laughs> I couldn't put up my hand because I don't have um, uh, a camera uh, in my computer. But I'm going to take uh, and go beyond what George Myers said very quickly in that I'm in um, the Haramar Heath area. So we're just outside the Bucks Pond area. We're not part of that, but we're within the Six Ponds area. And I, I'm, I think it would be beneficial to look at that area 
beyond Bucks Pond, which is an organized, Great Sand Lakes is organized, but there's a whole ring around that. And it's not being considered as feeding into those lakes. And there's been a tremendous amount of construction and a tremendous number uh, just since we started this process of new septic systems going in. And I'm going to suggest it be looked at it's not just mitigating what was there before, it's mitigating the very rapid, um, not only addition of septic systems, but in drastically increased use of fertilizer and insecticides. And that was my, <laughs> my chat that um, you, were re you were referencing. So that was just my point. So I'm gonna sign off the mic and let it go back to um, Russ or Anastasia or Dan. Thank you. Yeah, so just with respect to fertilizer bylaw, we, so the town did adopt one about a year ago. However, the chapter 262 of the acts of 2012 preempt local regulation because the Department of Agriculture and Resource, uh, Department DAR took over fertilizer regulation. So unfortunately we are unable to enact local regulations more stringent than the state. That said, if there are associations, you know, or um, things of that nature that do have the ability to impose, you know, some, if, if there's an association around the pond that can adopt its own fertilizer regulation, you know, we would love to discuss that with the association because fertilizer management is a component of our comprehensive wastewater management plan. Those areas that I'm referring to are not formally, uh, legally organized as entities as Great Sand Lakes is. So that's part of the problem. We are a, an ecological area that includes Great Sand Lakes. I'm not sure how to bridge that. Yeah, well, one of the things that we're we're planning on doing, and I, I do see your hand up, we'll get to you in just a second. So one of the things that we are doing um, is I plan on working with DEP over the next you know year or two. This is part of the watershed permit we have with the Pleasant Bay Alliance. Um, so that was one of the causes for adopting the fertilizer regulation, which was a component of our watershed permit that ultimately we weren't legally even allowed to act on. So because the 2012 regulations preempt our ability to adopt them. I have contacted DEP to work with them on a fertilizer uh, education campaign. Um, it's still very much in its infancy and I really don't even have any information to share about what that campaign is going to include because this is also very new. Um, but that is something that I am planning on working on um, as part of the watershed permit um, and the Board of Health to get those out as a town policy, a non-binding policy, unfortunately, because that's all we have the authority to do. So, Dan, um, Dan? Yeah. Dan, um, I actually got a quick question I'm thinking about for the for the folks that are expressing concern with the water quality around Bucks Pond. Uh, do those ponds have a watershed association that meets regularly? Um, is there an organized association or a group that looks out for the welfare of the ponds? George? George? I'm not aware of anybody outside of the Great Sand Lakes Association. We we test our ponds all summer long, and um, and and actually we we give all that information to Heinz, Heinz Prof, and um, but I don't know of any other uh, associations. Just seeing, you know, seeing that the majority of the comments tonight have been revolved, right? I'd, I'd be happy to come down and either talk to residents if we can find a location. I mean, I know we're supposed to get two feet of snow and there's all this COVID craziness, but um, it, it almost sounds like I'd like to come down and hear some more input and then talk about some of my experiences with other freshwater ponds in Cape Cod. I have worked with, the, you know, Brewster, but all these other towns with similar issue, algae blooms. I could go on and on and, and put half the room to sleep. Um, but it sounds like there should be a dedicated meeting strictly for this, Dan, and I'd be happy to come down and I can present some things from other towns. And I see a, lot of, like, I see um, a lot of people throwing a lot of hands, hands, a lot of activity. Yeah. yeah so <laughs> I think that makes sense. Uh, hi. But, um, oh, yeah. Uh, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't trying to get your attention. I was trying to figure out like, where the heck is my hand? I, I didn't realize it was reverse. 
Mm. <laughs> and, and you push a button and a little yellow hand appears. But anyway, so you just said something that really confuses me. I mean, Massachusetts is a home rule state, and and I thought the the, the thing was that bylaws cannot be less stringent. Bylaws I, to be so. Why is it different in this particular case? I, I mean, I know the fact. So why is it different in this case? Yeah. So if you bear with me one second, I will pull up my email and get the memo from legal counsel and hopefully answer your question. Oh my God. I withdraw the question. Not, <laughs> not legal. Counsel, please. <laughs> yeah. What are the, oh. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're certainly my default for legal advice. Um, <laughs> But give me one second here. All right. Uh, you can my computer's a little slow with the uh, go to meeting going, so. Uh, I don't mean to hold things up. I, I don't need oh, to know. Okay. It sounded so backwards to me. It was like as backwards as my hand moving. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, Harwich having its own home rule charter does give them, you know, kind of the right to to enact its own, you know, the way it operates. But this uh, these this was part of the special acts of Mass General Law. Had we adopted these regulations prior to 2012, mm -hmm. we would have been able to have them grandfathered in. Yeah. But because they weren't in by 2012, we couldn't have grandfathered. So that was the, that's why we don't have them now. Okay. So I think what you just said, though, there was some sort of statute from 2012 that trumps home yes. rule in this very specific thing. DAR. Okay. Thank so you. the attorney oh, general I, I has determined. Support highly. Uh, you come down and visit us here at Great Sand Lakes Association. Yeah, let me talk with Dan and I'll look to organize something and we'll spread the word um, and we'll, we'll, we'll figure out something hopefully, you know, within the next couple months to come down. I got a lot of examples, pictures from other ponds, same issues, what we've done, what works, what doesn't work, all sorts of all sorts of stuff. Patsy, do we have anybody to speak at the annual meeting yet? GSLA has an annual meeting. Yeah, I, I, we do not yet. As far as I know, we do not yet have anyone scheduled and I, I, I did want to say that we are an association around the Great Sand Lakes. We are not a homeowners association of the sort that tells you whether you can hang your laundry out or not. We are a voluntary association of members, but we do have um, many people on the in, in the association who are very, very interested in water quality issues. So it would be absolutely wonderful if you could come in and spend time with us. Um, we'll I'd be, be happy to speak, Patsy. I'd be happy yes. to. If you can, if you can, um, and that's the exact question. Now, is there is there an association that looks out for the welfare of the pond? That's yeah. the exactly what. Absolutely. Because I'm speaking to a bunch of associations, um, Red Lily Pond, Barnstable, all the way up and down with on this exact topic. So I'd be happy to. Great. That we'll we'll we'll, we'll coordinate. <laughs> absolutely. And I found my sentence. <laughs> it says the. <laughs> Chapter 262 of the Acts of 2012 amend various sections of Chapter 128 of Mass General Law. The amendments made clear that regulation of plant nutrient applications is primarily a matter for the Department of Agricultural Resources and not individual cities and towns. The exception being if they were adopted prior to 2012. So that um, that plays into the whole spraying um, utility company spraying thing too, right? Yes, however, we have uh, undergone an excellent project with the Food Forest Initiative. There's a local group in Harwich uh, that actually planted a bunch of edible uh, plantings, native uh, plantings along the utility easement on well water department property to push back you know, we worked with the utility company uh, and they agreed not to apply herbicide in areas where the group planted these, the plantings and we're gonna maintain the easement. So um, there is a very active group here and 
we look to do more projects like that. I know there's been a lot of wild wildflower projects and stuff. So at least we at the water department are looking to those sorts of projects to push out those herbicide application boundaries as far as we can to protect the water supply. So, um, so I I get the importance of sewering, but I was sitting here thinking I don't think sewering is going to do anything for the you know fertilizers in the landscape. And then you mentioned this thing that, you know, we can't regulate fertilizers locally, but um, is there a way to go around it backwards? Like we, we have decided we want to try to get natural landscape, you know, speaking of APCC, thank goodness for them um, and, and other entities, the uh, extension and whatever that have information about natural landscapes. And we're thinking of like changing our do away with turf lawn and only have uh, like clover, micro clover, something like that. But so I wonder if, if there's like a, a back door into it, like instead of re regulating fertilizer, maybe within the, um, you know, we're in a groundwater protection overlay district, maybe it could be a zoning thing. No turf grass allowed within, you know, X feet or within the overlay district. And then you're not regulating fertilizer, you're just requiring a type of vegetation that, that doesn't, doesn't require to survive. The great, so it's 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 a great idea, and I I I'm struggling to remember. I forget. I don't know if it was California or there was another state. I read an article somewhere where they abandoned they banned turf grass for water protection purposes. Now, that has another whole set of implications that we have to work out because believe it or not, the fourth tier of the water usage for our water bills generates 50% of the revenue for the entire water department. So there's other balancing factors that we need to work out, but certainly in areas where, you know, that cert I'd have to discuss that with the town planner and obviously there'd be a lot more, but yes. I think other towns have done, you know, incentive programs where, for example, you mentioned micro clover. Funny, I just planted it last uh, last fall in my backyard. You know, towns have given out, you know, whether it's suitable fertilizer, free seed, things like that to make it easier for the homeowner, just to, you know, little things to make it better. And education is the biggest thing with this. Um, I know Mashby made all the residents pump the septic tanks out um, around Santua Pond in the short term. I mean, does it help? Yeah. Is it going to solve the problem? No. Um, but yeah, there are some other steps. And if we, we come down and talk, I can talk about what some other towns have done too to help manage help manage this. Uh, I I would strongly encourage you to talk about alternatives to turf grass because we are concerned around here. And some of us, you know, I if if he's considering it, I'm sure others will. Well, and with an association, it's easy to to implement something like that too. You know, then. Somewhat, maybe not. I don't know. I haven't been a part of my right association. Thing to do, you know, <laughs> when you see the glow in the dark, you know, a glowing green lawn in February, you know that um, it's 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 just we gotta do better. You know, we're all part of this problem. We just have to do better. We all do. So I do see some people starting to drop off. I would welcome anyone who has not spoke yet to please hop on and provide your input and comment. For anybody listening, we were supposed to have another session Saturday in person, which obviously um, is going to be canceled with the weather events. So I think, Dan, that's going to be too de to be determined a follow up session. Yeah, we were gonna, we were yeah in person. We were going to try to host it remotely with the potential for a blizzard in 24 inches uh, or 12, depending on where you are. Um, power may be intermittent on Saturday. So. I guess, oh, Joe, did you have uh, something else? Yes. Um, yeah, I just want to, I've already spoken, of course, but I just wanted to make one more comment. Um, I, I, I wasn't aware that, that uh, Dennis had actually dropped out of this um, three-town proposal, and now it's just, I'm sorry, Yarmouth had dropped out of the three-town proposal. But when, when I was reading about the 2048 um, for for the, the Great Sand Lakes area there, that, that was, I think, when they had this three-town proposal um, going forward. And if anything, that's gonna push things back even more. 
And again, the, the thing I was trying to get across is that uh, I, I think leaving these three ponds or this whole pond situation here, where the engineering work, some of the engineering work was done by that company in Boston, because I've got diagrams showing pumping stations and everything else um, that goes up through, through uh, Queen Anne Road to John Joseph and covers all the properties there. Everything is all uh, documented in these spreadsheets that uh, the Boston, uh, I can't remember the name of the company, but uh, David uh, Young's company there when, when they were doing it. So they did some of the preliminary work on that. And of course they basically put the sewers in pretty much for uh, phase one and phase two all around East Harwich there. So I, I, I would say that with this extra money coming in, we ought to, ought to give some priority to finishing this, this, this thing that's already been started um, and not leave it go until the very end of every every bit of sewering in Harwich. Um, so I just wanted to reiterate that point I already made. That that's all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anyone else who'd like to jump on? Just scanning that. If everyone has um, satisfied and made their comment, then I guess we will call tonight's uh, meeting complete. Um, and we will be looking to host another meeting in the next couple of weeks uh, to reschedule the Saturday session. So if you think of anything between now and the next one, feel free to participate. And uh, thank you, Russ, Anastasia. And thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. It was great. Thank you, Russ, Dan, and Anastasia. Thank you. Good night. Good night.